recording. Welcome to the first sensation and perception uh, live stream class. Um, yeah, I'm sure when you were like, oh, I can't wait to go to college. I'm going to do live stream classes with my professor. Mm, no. Um, so, yeah, depth perceptions. We're starting a new topic. And, um, luckily the first part's pretty easy. First part's pretty easy. Um, but, uh, it gets a little bit dicier toward the back end. So we'll see. We're gonna, we're gonna, sh this is how we're gonna finish up Vision, everyone. We're just gonna finish up Vision. Um, we're gonna do the best we can. Um, I, I just uploaded, it's not live yet, but I uploaded Health Psych's video to YouTube, and I certainly, um, certainly discovered that, um, YouTube doesn't like when you use other people's videos, especially when they have copyrighted music on them. So, I'm gonna try to play this, and we'll see what happens. Let me know in the chat if it's laggy, um, because my preview window, uh, on my monitor is, um, doesn't get laggy because it's, it's, the internal feed. Um, so let me know if it gets laggy. Um, can't really do anything else about that. But this is Viewmaster. Viewmaster. You're all familiar with Viewmaster, right? So Google resurrected it. So that's that's what this is. Probably nine. I just remember. And so it's a toy about depth perception. You know what my favorite thing to do when I was your age was put a reel in the Viewmaster and just fly away to the moon, take a trip through outer space. Yeah, mm -hmm. that was must have been real fun, dude. These are really awesome, though. So we're gonna talk a little bit about stereoscopic vision. And um, should probably turn this down. I'm yelling over it. So we're gonna talk about stereoscopic vision, and that's how the Viewmaster works. And then so Google made this new one, and yeah. Yeah, so really cool. We're done watching it, though. Um, so anyways, if you want to get to the and so they made it, they revived it with Mattel. Um, they revived it with Mattel and made a new one, right? So there's the old one on the screen, on the, um, on the paused image there. And, uh, and they made a new one, and it's uh, apparently really cool, and um, but also not, like, huge. Like, it's not a toy that people want, because we have VR now, so who cares? <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, woo! Moving right along. Um, so we're going to talk about depth perception. We're going to talk about, uh, first, like, what... What happens if you were only to have one eye? And if you were in my Psych 101 class, this will be review to you because many of the examples that I used uh, when I talked about depth perception in Psych 101, Gen Psych, um, these, they're the same examples because I, I like them and that's why, so I keep using them. Um, so this is, I, I really enjoy doing this one um, because, uh, you know, we all need a drink right now, right? Uh, so this little man is getting his daily vodka. Mm, excuse me. And, um, you know, he's a tiny little man. But as you know, as you obviously know, it's it's not real. The, the added pegs on that... Um, stool are actually not there and the guy is standing in the back corner of uh that display case the the great thing about this whole scene right here is this is at a conference this is at a research conference and i'm betting it was a psychology re research conference where they're like hey let's do a fun little air uh, aims room demonstration about depth perception and so they went and they did this. Um, obviously, that's not open, okay? And um, he's standing far away from her. But, you know, if you didn't know that, 
You would look at, like, you know, why is this little old man standing on a stool trying to get an alcoholic beverage from this woman? You know, that seems like way too much alcohol, right? So we're going to first talk about the Q approach. And the Q approach only needs one eyeball. You only need one eyeball. So um, you may have heard in some passing that um, Cyclopses can't perceive depth. Like, you know, oh, you lost an eye, or the pirate has an eye patch. He can't perceive depth, your depth perception. While it is true that depth perception is severely impacted in a human by the loss of an eye, because we, we have two, right? And a backup eye. Um, you can perceive a lot of depth information just by having one eyeball. So if you end up losing an eye in um, some sort of uh, I don't know, accidental rock, paper, scissors accident using real rocks, paper, and scissors, uh, then, yeah, you'll be fine. You'll be fine. Um, and mo most of the cues that we get for our single eye has to do with how things are being occluded, right? So you know that my... My, uh, my left hand is closer to you in the field of view of the camera than is my right hand, than is my face, because all of those things are being occluded by the, the other things, right? So um, that's what we're going to talk about. And it has to do with where those points hit on the retina. So here you can see that the tree, indicated by T, and the house, indicated by H, end up on different points on the retina. And if the person is looking at H, okay? See where the, it's a f straight dotted line to H, right? So that's gonna end up on the fovea, okay? Then what we end up with is T, or at least the top of the tree, is going to be below this is what it comes out to. It's below the blind spot. And so you end up with a situation on the retina like this. And so the information that your brain gets is that the house must be farther away than the tree. Okay. Um, and we learn a lot of these connections uh, as we grow older, but... The visual cliff experiments. The visual cliff experiments show us that our depth perception is actually fairly innate. Um, but those studies were done with children with two working eyes, so uh, it's hard to know whether or not a um, a child that is born with only one working eye has innate depth perception or not. And yes, Stephanie, if it was not in the, if it was in the blind spot, we we wouldn't see the tree, at least that point of the tree. Yeah, in, definitely. Um and so uh, these monocular cues that we're going to go through are primarily a function of repeated exposure. So learning. So these monocular cues are learned. Okay? Uh but before we go through the single eyeball I just want to talk about um, depth cues from the uh, muscles in our eyes. So, um, the idea here is that the muscles in our eyes, and we talked about those muscles just a, a little bit when we were talking about the um, corollary discharge theory, they tell us how we're looking. Okay, so the corollary discharge theory aids uh, the information that we get depending on how the muscles are uh, tensed or contracting. Okay, so there are two um, there are two ways there, there are two cues that your eyes do. So convergence occurs when we cross our eyes. So that's A here, right? So that's this one here. That's convergence, okay? So when we move our eyes inward. 
The cue that we get from convergence is that we're looking at something closer to our face. Okay, because if we weren't converging, then we, our eyes would be straight out. They would be pointed forward, um, typically. Okay, uh, and and the process by which we are constantly doing that, looking at things far away, looking at things closer, looking at things far away, is accommodation. And our lens will change shape depending on what it is we're looking at in order to maximize the refraction of the light that we're getting in. So you do have tiny little muscles, and I, I don't remember, you'd have to go back to an older image, I think, of the eyeball. There's uh, the little, it, it looks like uh, the artists like did this, sitting on top of the eye, right, um, in red. There are tiny, teeny, teeny, tiny little muscles attached to the top and the bottom of the lens and they pull and they shrink or they relax. They pull, they contract, and then they relax. And so that changes the shape of the lens. So that's accommodation. Changing the shape of the lens, accommodation, eyeballs moving in or straight in, in they don't really go that way. You can't, can't really do that. Um, but in or straight, in, straight, that's convergence, okay? Um, Yeah, so as Katerina said, you know, depth perception, you can do this in your house. <laughs> you can do this um, and see whether or not which eye is better at depth perception. We'll go through each of those cues. A lot of the times people have a dominant eye. Um, so if you ever gone and sh shot a weapon or, you know, um, any kind of aiming, you kind of use your dominant use your dominant eye, you know, that sort of thing. Do -do -do. That's all ocular motor based, or sorry, um, monocular based. Um, and then David asks, is depth perception reduced in patients who have corneal transplants? Um, it depends on what kind of depth perception that you're talking about. Uh, I'm going to say, well, corneal transplants, the outside of the eye. So I'm going to say no. Um, and if they get corneal transplants later in life, then none of these associations that they have encountered are going to be impacted because it's it's all learned. All of these monocular uh, cues, all of these cues have been learned. Um, so if you get a corneal transplant later in life, that's not going to affect it. But that's a good question. I like it. All right, monocular cues. So there are several monocular cues. Again, most of them are based in occlusion. Okay, so monocular just means one eye, mono, ocular, eye, uh, mono, one, ocular, eye, that's what I meant to say, right? So pictorial cues. We're just going to talk about pictorial cues. I mean, these really do also apply to 3D, um, mainly because we detect depth in 2D images. Uh, when there's depth information to detect. Uh, but uh, because we're going to be using 2D images, that's why we're, we're talking about this from a pictorial standpoint. Because we can't talk about this from a real-life standpoint because uh, I can't show you... Uh, we're, we're not talking about real life. I'm not going to show you... Um, if you want to determine depth in 3D, just look around. Look, look around. Uh, so we're going to talk about this from the perspective of 2D images, pictures, uh, drawings, um, designs, digital designs, that sort of thing, that are technically two dimensions, right? We only have a uh, picture plane and a uh, height plane, okay? Uh, an X and a Y axis. We don't, we don't actually have a Z plane or a depth plane, but we get the, that information about Z from what's in the image, okay? So the first one does have to be occlusion, okay? And so here are my uh, desaturated uh, balloons, okay? My desaturated balloons. So we know that uh, this balloon 
at least this one right here, is farther away than this one because this one, the one in the foreground of the image, partially occludes, and it's only a tiny little fraction right here, this balloon, okay? And this balloon occludes this balloon to a much larger degree, right? And so we know that based on that analysis, that quick, quick analysis, it's not even analysis, uh, that this one is closer than this one, regardless of size and any other uh, information that we get, right? Because this is, I'm going to be talking about a lot of these cues uh, as uh, in a vacuum, but honestly, this is a multi-dimensional image. We get more than just occlusion depth information from this desaturated image. And I desaturated it because, um, you know, color is going to add another dimension to the depth, okay? Uh, relative height is the next one, okay? This is a comparison, and here is my, um, again, uh, got it over, right over my right shoulder. Um, this is a scene from the Pirates of the Caribbean. The ship is sinking, and that's Jack Sparrow up on the top. Um, So I can start re hit record, hit hit record. Uh, okay, so we were talking about height lines, and um, so these green lines here they they reflect uh, the 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 horizontal position of things closest to you compared to the horizon line. You can also compare them to each other. So um, height lines that are farther away from the horizon are. Um, closer to you, right? Because the horizon, which we'll discuss in a little bit, um, is the farthest thing that you can actually see. That's why it's called the horizon, okay? It's the farthest thing you can ever see. And it's constantly changing depending on, you know, conditions and, and visibility and how far you can actually see and uh, all that all that, all that, that jazz. Uh, so um, and you can also compare these height lines to each other. So we know that relatively this canoe or safety boat is about the same distance away from me as this other ship here, but they're closer than this ship or that ship because those, th this one is definitely close to the horizon. It's almost on the horizon, right? And then things dip below the horizon because the earth is round, right? Um, okay. Whew. Uh, Stream, hang on for another 20-something minutes, please. All right. Monocular, more monocular cues. So relative size and familiar size go together in this uh, idea. And uh, I bring in here this old-timey photograph. Um, he's probably the first guy to ever do these uh, perspective-changing photographs. You know, because, let's be honest, they're all very annoying um, kinds of photos. Or at least that's... That's mine. That's, you know, that's mine. Uh, that's mine's. Um, so we have this guy. He looks like a giant. He's going to stick his hand on to the top of the Eiffel Tower. But of course, we know that the Eiffel Tower is huge, okay? And we know that humans have a relative size, right? They're, we know what humans look like. And so when we compare the two, we're like, this can't be, it's, it's a fun trick. It's a fun trick of perspective, but it's not real. Um, we know the guy is so close. He's all the way down Champs-Élysées because there's no way that he is, unless he's some sort of uh, mutant, uh, uh, what are they, uh, what are those things called now in the monster realm? Um, uh, somebody's in the chat's going to tell me what the, uh, I don't know. Godzilla and all the things from monsters versus, I don't know. Anyways, kaiju. There we go. I see. I remembered it just, yeah. Anyways, it's just, it, it's like, uh, it, it's the monsters. So, uh, the term for all giant monsters is kaiju. Um, perspective convergence. So, you know, you drew this in grade school. Right. You drew your 
train tracks converging at a single point on the horizon. Uh, you drew a horizontal line, and then you drew those two lines. But they're parallel. It would be very bad for a train if they weren't parallel, right? So, yeah. Parallel lines converge at the horizon because... Or they seem like they converge at the horizon. Uh, because the information that we get from far away is less than from what we have close together things move toward each other in our field of view um, when we look toward the horizon. The, the spaces between the points on the retina become very, very small for those specks of light because they have to travel farther. And so these end up, um, these end up uh, looking like they converge, even though that would be very bad, like I said. All right, atmospheric perspective, things are fuzzy the farther away they are, okay? And if you are looking outside, and this is very important, this is for outside, that's why it's atmospheric, there is a blue tint to them. So blue wavelengths are shorter, but they're also scattered by, um, they're also scattered I'm not dropping any frames, Cammy. I'm sorry. That might be on your end. Uh, I might want to refresh the screen. Uh, I'm not dropping any frames, actually, which is magical. Um, that's, so that's cool. Um, so they're blue because uh, nitrogen atoms scatter blue light. Okay, so nitrogen forms about 70%-ish. Uh, sorry. Um, sorry, almost 80%, 78%, that's what I wanted to say, 78% of our atmosphere. And so because they scatter blue wavelengths of light, the farther away you go, the more nitrogen you're actually looking into, the more um, nitrogen is being scattered in your perspective. And so things become fuzzy and things become bluer. It's just a tint. It's not like you look out in the distance and you're like, oh my gosh, it's so blue. Uh, it's just that those short wavelengths are being scattered more. Da, 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 da. Texture gradient. So here's a, a picture of people not following social distancing rules right now. It's jerks. Uh, they're in some sort of race um, for some sort of cure, I imagine. So you always have to race for cures. Uh, we can pick out. I don't know how your screen is right now. My screen is a bit... It's a bit tiny of an image, but... Suspend your disbelief for just a minute. So you can sort of catch more information about these people right here, okay? Or any group of people. But as you move farther away, they all turn into just colored specks. So the information that we get from texture gradients is that the less information from the texture that we get and the closer those textures are packed, the farther that information is away from us. So the more information we get from texture, and here, yes, people, these people are my texture example. Um, the more we get from, the more information we get, that means they're closer, okay? Again, multi-dimensional, multi-dimensional image, more depth cues just uh, beyond um, texture gradient because we also have occlusion, right? Occlusion also sits here. Shadows. This is one of my favorite ones. Shadows. So, um, usually ask somebody in class to, um, to, to engage with me on this one. Um, it's a little, it's a little laggy on the stream. Can't really, can't really do it on the stream. But, um, so... On this blue blue checkerboard, this um, two shades of blue checkerboard, we have this set of um, we have the set of balls, okay, three dimensional balls. This checkerboard is in three dimensions because of perspective convergence. Yes, I knew you were saying that in your head. I could just hear it. Okay, D doing it in chat would be a little too. Um, uh, delayed. So <laughs> perspective convergence, of course. That, so you get that information about perspective 
or and and depth because the checkerboard is trapezoidal, right? It looks like a trapezoid. It's got a smushed trapezoid. But again, we perceive it as an extending into the depth plane trapezoid. Uh, or technically a square, because that's what a checkerboard is. And then we have these balls here. And w if we look at these balls, the information kind of, at least for me, it might be different for you. Um, depth perception is not always the same for everyone. It's, it's not an individual difference per se, but it, it can you can get different information depending on who you are and what you know and what you've seen. So uh, for me, when I look at this, it looks like these two balls here are extending deeper into the image. And so the closest ball to me is this one here in the middle. Okay, You might see that now that I've told you top-down processing, you might see it too. But if I add some shadows to it, okay, now the information you're getting really indicates the trajectory of these balls. The balls have not moved. Their pixels have stayed the same in, from this image to this image. Checkerboard hasn't moved either. We just added some shadows, okay? And because of the light from above heuristic, again, the light coming from above kind of makes it look like, uh, we, we, we kind of already have it. But if we add the shadows, if we add the shadow to this ball, now we know where it actually falls on this chessboard where this one falls, where this one falls. And then if we look at this one, they actually look like they're floating now, just based on the shadows, okay? They're floating. So that's, sh that's how shadows can in indicate depth. And it's, and it's uh, you know, obviously one of the major things that moving through a three-dimensional world will give us and again you only need one eye for it okay all right uh, da, 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 da. um now again monocular cues work for these and they're motion based so this is um depth information from motion with one eyeball Okay, depth information from motion with one eyeball. And the major one is the motion parallax. Okay, it's one of the coolest names ever. Uh, so you've probably been a passenger at some point in your life, and you've probably looked out the window at stationary things while you were moving. And it may have seemed to you when you were moving that uh, things far away looked like they were moving with you as opposed to away from you, like the things closer to you. That is the motion parallax. Things moving away from you move at incredible speed away from you. Things that move with you seem to like lumber along, okay? Those mountains or those tree line off in the distance, right? Uh, so... That's the motion parallax. And I think the, uh, the makers of Super Mario did this beautifully. Because even though the mountains are moving away from Mario the faster he goes, look at the ones in the back on this GIF. Okay? They actually look like they're moving along with him in a forward direction, or at least left to right. Whereas the other stuff is moving quickly right to left, away from how Mario is moving, okay? So that's the motion parallax. Next time you're a passenger in something, you have to be moving because it's depth information produced by cues. Uh, depth information produced by motion cues, excuse me. Look at that. Now he's... You know, he gets the... Um, he gets the thing. Anyways, um, the other motion cue is deletion and or accretion. They're essentially the same thing. It just depends on how you're moving, okay? So deletion is my, my right hand is going to delete across my left hand. That's deletion. Look at that. I'm occluding it now. Ah! 
and then accretion is moving away from and uncovering, okay? So deletion is what happens when you are starting an eclipse, and accretion is when you are ending an eclipse. So your lunar, your solar eclipses. So if you were out in the, um, um, hanging out in, in central Illinois back in uh, 2017, August 2017, and you watched the uh, nearly, nearly full eclipse. We weren't totally full where we were, um, but at least in, in this part of, of central Illinois, I don't know where you were, but many of you are actually probably at Eureka doing the event. Um, that's deletion. So the moon coming to cover the sun, that's deletion. And then when it's like, peace out, y'all, that is accretion, okay? All right, enough of Mario. Any questions about monocular cues before we uh, end today talking about um, binocular depth? We definitely have to, you know, whew. <laughs> it's probably going to be a mixed topic Friday, finishing depth, starting hearing. Any questions? Sound off in chat questions. I'll pause for a couple of minutes. Well, maybe not a couple of minutes, but a minute or so. Okay, stay green, chat, or uh, bitrate. Please, please stay green. I haven't dropped any frames, so that's fundaba. Okay, it's back up. Woo! All right, is are folks still in chat? I mean, yeah, it's 31 viewers. Okay, no questions. Cool. All right, cool, 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 cool. Yeah, if you have any questions, you feel free to email me or message me or anything like that. Um, <laughs> yes, please do. Um, good luck. I will. Get, I will grant you good luck. Um, she is not as sweet as she seems. I'll tell you that one. Ugh. <laughs> oh man, not as sweet as she seems. Great. <laughs> oh man. I, I I love her to death, of course. Mm. Uh, if you hear that whirring, by the way, that that constant whirring, I have a space heater right. Just about right there. Um, because it's cold in my basement, can we just, can I just, can we just get warm already? I'm tired of the freaking snow yesterday. Get, get out of here. These March 20 something snowstorms. Get out of here. It's like that last year. Oh, good times. All right. Not seeing any questions about monocular cues. It's so pretty straightforward. Um, it's a, a simple case of reviewing. Yeah, yeah, exactly, Katerina. Seriously. Um, also, not feeling well yesterday, and the day before that, and the day before that, really sucked. Um, okay. Uh, monocular cues, generally speaking, um, what's the What's the occlusion factor? What is what is the image trying to tell you? What information are you getting from the image? That sort of thing is what uh, monocular cues really give you. Essentially flashcard territory um, for the most part. Uh, all right, so with the remaining few minutes we have in the stream, I'm gonna go through depth perception even if I go beyond 250, just to end this on a on a um, topic instead of like breaking up a topic because again, this video is going up on YouTube and, and uh, um, I wanna make sure the topic ends, right? So we're gonna do binocular depth. If you have to go at 250, then by all means head on out, that's totally fine. Um, but I'm going to keep going until uh, I'm, I'm done with binocular depth perception. You can watch it. Um, you can 
watch the end of this video later. All right, so we've got two eyeballs, right? We've got two eyeballs. I've got two eyeballs. Uh, everybody in class, I believe, has two eyeballs. Neurotypically, people have two eyeballs. Humans have two eyeballs. Um, we evolved to have two eyeballs, of course. Uh, changes, mutations can occur along the way. Change that. But, you know, for the most part, two eyeballs, right? Um, and so, actually, the vast majority of our depth information comes from the fact that we have two eyeballs. And that those two eyeballs, and this is very important, those two eyeballs are pointed forward. I'm, I'm, Peyton, you want her, you want her still? I don't know if you guys can hear that screaming, but you want her still? Yeah. Mm. Amazing. She probably wants food. Uh, <clears throat> so, um, for those of you who have gone to the doctor or go to the eye doctor frequently, one of the tests that you have to do is cover one eye. Uh, you, you, you do both eyes. And then you have to look at things, okay? Um, they do this on a, on a image, on a device that you kind of, excuse me, put your face into. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> it's funny. Yeah, mood. Mm. Mm. Uh, so if we were to cover one eye, technically this image says right eye closed, but you can cover it, okay? And we are looking at our fingers like this, okay? If, if oh man, I, I would, um, I'd totally have you all do it in class if you want to do it with me. Put your fingers in front of you and then um, close one eye and open the other. And um, they'll start, they'll, they'll move. You'll see them move just a little bit. Okay? And so, if we were to put them in line, okay? Um, and we closed our right eye. So if we put them in line for our left eye, the, the near finger is completely occluding the far finger, and that is that um, my left eye, the image on my retina is technically the near finger, because the near and far finger light information is coming at the same time, okay? I don't know how that looked on camera, but I'm probably, um, probably fun. Um, but if I did that same thing, and I closed my left eye, I would end up now with being able to see both fingers, okay? Uh, and that is because my near finger now is over off on the periphery while my far finger is closer to my fovea, okay? So that's the, that's gonna be the heart of our depth perception, um, binocular depth perception here is that uh, when we look at things with both eyes, the information goes to different places on our retinas. Okay? And that's important. All right. Yes. Uh, who is this? Yes, Emma. Um, they do. Uh, I don't know if I have it on these sets of slides as far as animal uh, perception uh, is um, is concerned. You're definitely at the end of your at the end of the chapter in this book. Uh, it depends on uh, what the an the animal and how far apart they are on their heads. So you end up with an overlap, okay? So animals with, like, severe eyes on the sides of their heads, like whales or dolphins, for example, they actually have no binocular depth perception because there's no overlap of those visual fields. You need overlap of visual fields to get binocular depth perception. So they don't. Rabbits, on the other hand, maybe they're a little closer. Their, head, their faces are smaller. Their heads are smaller. And so there's some overlap. They're more concerned, and, and you see this 
in animals that are prey versus animals that are predators. Um, fish and marine mammals not included in this because their evolution is different than land animals. But with land mammals, you see this. Predators have eyes facing forward. Prey have eyes facing to the side. Okay, So most of their depth information comes from uh, monocular cues with a little bit of depth overlap, binocular cue, okay? Um, because they're more concerned about having a huge field of vision, okay? The better field of vision you have, the more that you can see, right? And so evolutionary speaking, evolutionarily speaking, uh, having eyes on the sides of your head gives you a gigantic swath of a visual field to catch all those predators. Predators, on the other hand, only need their eyes faced forward because they can get as much depth perception, much depth information as possible. It's really quite cool. Just to make sure that they, you know, get the prey. They pounce the right way, right? They um, s swipe or maul the correct amount, right? And not like, oh, in front of me, but like actually hitting their target. Um, so that's a, that's a very good question, and it, it depends on the animal. Um, okay. So, we're going to talk about stereoscopy. Stereoscopy. Or scopy, but that's how it, stereoscopy is how it's pronounced. Okay, so 2D and 3D movies. 2D movies. Have you guys, you guys seen 2D movies, right? That's what pretty much most films are, 2D movies. Recording three-dimensional information on a flat surface, that's two dimensions, right? So how do they make three-dimensional uh, movies? You've gone seen 3D movies. They're fairly garbage, but you've seen them, right? Um, with those stereoscopic glasses that you have to, um, that you have to wear. Uh, it's, it's really, really simple how it's done. You have one camera, right next to another camera, like literally parked right next to each other, okay? Um, and what happens when you overlay those two image is this. You get this uh, blurring, this blurring effect, right? And uh, <laughs> when you overlay, when you, and then when you tell the person with use of those, you know, stereoscopic glasses, which image the eye actually only gets to look at, you end up giving that image depth. And so that is what stereoscopy is, okay? Or, uh, and then you can say that's stereoscopic, okay? A disorder in binocular depth perception is called strabismus, okay? I'm not going to go through stereosu, uh, but for people with strabismus, and strabismus is um, fairly common, uh, depth information from binocular cues is limited because of the eye that's not in concert with the other eye. So strabismus has a, an, un, uh, an unflattering moniker called lazy eye, right? I, I, Probably not a good idea to to uh, you know use that term. It's fairly pejorative. Um, so uh, use strabismus. It's a hard word to say, of course, but definitely use that. Um, and so that's a disorder of binocular depth perception because uh, the eyes are not in sync with each other. Uh, there is surgery um, to correct strabismus. You can ask Peyton um, Peyton Williams. Not not Peyton in this class, but. Peyton Williams, if you're familiar with her, um, she will gladly show you her corneal scar. Ugh. Okay. All right. So, how is it that then... So, I go back to the, the image... Well, the image... The idea that we started with. Okay. Where we end up with two different... Two different 
images on the retina. This is called binocular disparity. And the greater the disparity, the greater the depth. Okay? Slow. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So. And disparity is essentially just a subtraction process, right? So we are going to subtract A from F, okay? We're going to subtract A from F or F from A. And that, that, that value that you get, this conceptual value that you get from A for F, and you can use angular disparity here, um, is the amount of disparity, the amount of distance away two things are. Okay, so the greater the angular disparity on the retina, the farther the two objects are away from each other. The, the closer they are, the smaller the amount of disparity. Okay, um, so we're going to talk about the uh, ways to quote unquote calculate this. Okay, so when you're looking out across the horizon, um, you have a, an aspect of your vision called the horopter. And it's a horizontal plane of your fovea. Okay. So it's a sphere, technically, of where your focus is all around you. So if you were to turn around in 360 degrees, you would have a horopter, an imaginary line, all around you. Where you're, if you were just looking, looking straight ahead. Okay. No changes, no looking down, no looking up, no moving your head, nothing. Just s standing, staring straight forward, 360 degrees imaginary line. That's the horopter, okay? And so if we look here at this image, we've got Owen. He's staring at Julie. Julie's face falls along his horopter. So does the tree, okay? This tiny little tree, sapling, if you will. Yeah, it, it's 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 almost three, everyone. So if you wanna take off, then then by all means, do what you gotta do. I am gonna finish binocular disparity and binocular vision um, to anyone who wants to. So if we take this image and just flatten it here, look on the top side, top side down. Okay, we have the tree and Julie on the horopter. So here's Julie. Here's the tree, okay? And Julie is going to fall on the fovea because we're looking at Julie. But of course, we have this sphere around us. And so, yeah, the tree is going to fall on our retina someplace, okay? So our eyes are converged on Julie at the horopter, okay? That's falling on the fovea. F stands for fovea in this image. The tree falls to the uh, to the left of the fovea on each eyeball. Okay. They correspond to each other. If we are looking at items on the horopter, then we have correspondence. Okay. However. We get depth, so there's no depth information for corresponding points, okay? Julie is on the fovea, the red dots here. The tree is on the same place on both eyes' retinas to the left of the fovea. These are called corresponding points. See right here, corresponding points. No depth information. And that's because they're both on the horopter. Okay? So binocular depth comes from non-corresponding points. Okay? So here we have a tree and a finger. The fovea, we are looking at the tree. The tree is on the horopter. Okay, so the fovea is the tree, although I don't know how you can see the roots, but that's okay. The finger is in front of the tree. To my right eye, 
it falls to the right of the fovea. To my left eye, it falls to the left of the fovea. These are non-corresponding points. The greater the disparity between the non-corresponding points and the fovea, the farther the objects are away from each other. The closer they are, the closer these points are, means that they're closer to each other, okay? So farther means farther, closer means closer. I hope that, I hope that, that mnemonic works. I'm not entirely sure. It's the first time I've ever used it, so I'm not entirely sure if it's gonna work for you, okay? I didn't want to use any numbers in, in this, right? So what I wanted to do is the non-corresponding points here reflect two different points on the retina, right? We're, we're here, the right of the retina, we're here at the left of the retina, or retina, fovea, sorry, not retina, fovea, okay? The closer these points are to here, means the closer that my other object in my field of view is to what's on the fovea. The farther, so let's say these dashed lines were coming up to the edge of the retina over here and over here, that means they're, it's even closer to me and the objects are even farther, okay? Okay. All right, thanks, Stephanie. Um, so I can go over this more uh, at a review session at a later date. I, I'm not, um, I'm not uh, against going back to this in case anyone needs it. Um, I conceptually, I just wanted you to understand that when images, when we have two eyes and we have information from two eyes and the points are non-corresponding, and this can be anything, right? We're, here we're just looking at finger, and here we're just looking at, at, at you know, two objects, a tree and a finger, right? Just do something like, something like this, right? Excuse me. Um, you know, it doesn't really take into account how rich our visual environment is. So Emma asks, is there an infinite number of heropters in your field of vision depending on your point of focus? Yeah, so th that's a good question. So there's a single heropter and it's wherever your eyes are looking, okay? So if you have neurotypical eyes, okay, um, there's a single heropter and it's wherever your focus is. So if you're looking down, your heropter is the imaginary sphere wherever you're looking. So there's, there's only one heropter. Just like there's only one horizon, right? Um, so, yeah. So the heropter in this image is up here by this tree, right? Because that's where we're looking, right? And so the finger is in front, technically, of the heropter in this particular example. Yeah. Okay, uh, and then I think the last thing I wanted to talk about, yeah, the last thing I wanted to talk about is uh, stereopsis. Um, that is the information that you get from binocular disparity. So stereopsis is the perception of depth from having two eyeballs facing forward, or two eyeballs that have some overlapping field of vision, okay? Um, and so you can do, you can get stere, uh, stereopsis, um, from, from images. Okay. So this, these are those, uh, fun, uh, this is, I mean, it's just black and white, but you know, those, um, those magic, those magic, uh, images where you like cross your eyes and then you pull it away and you're like, Oh my God, I see the depth. Um, so that's what these images are. And essentially they are, uh, they're mathematical. Uh, the Viewmaster, like I said, that's, um, that's uh, old school stereopsis there, right? Uh-oh, uh, stream drive. All right, so I'm gonna end it there because this 
the stream failed again.